Praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody can hear me okay? If you love Jesus, say amen. All the boys can hear me? Say amen. Girls? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I thank, want to thank Pastor uh, so much for trusting me with his, his platform, his pulpit. I'm taking my wedding ring off. I'm going to throw some pots here in a minute. But it's, thank you, Pastor Tyler. I appreciate you letting me just be part of your ministry. I don't know how intimate many of you are with your pastor, but he has been one of the kindest and friendliest pastors I've ever met. There's no judgment in him. And he's really loved our family. And I, I just wanted to salute him for being the man of God he is. Amen? It's really remarkable. And you already know how special your church is. And I have traveled to hundreds of churches all over the world, so why would I park my family in here? See, see, I, I trust your church with my kids. That's a pretty big endorsement. If you get, I could go anywhere, you know, I could go to a lot of churches, but I, I like coming in here. Uh, Miss Greg from Dayspring, I'd like to salute her. She, she said, you need to meet, you need to meet Pastor Ford. He's different. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but he really is. And I know he stands on the shoulders of a great pastor that planted this church. And for years, I, I would hear about Pastor Jack. And I never had the opportunity to visit. But when I came, I was, it was confirmation. These guys had really been building an excellent ministry here in Mariana. Amen? And, it's, and you're a part of that. Praise God. And as a missionary and as an evangelist, my job is to link you up with the world that still needs Jesus. Right? That's my, that's my primary calling in life. So, Father, we just surrender to you today. Father, you rode in on that powerful worship here. These are your people, and they are truly gifted and anointed. So, Father, we just yield to you, Holy Spirit, right now. Take control of this service, everything that goes on. Satan is defeated. He's bound and will be put to an open shame by the love of your gospel today. Confirm it. I know you will. You always confirm your gospel. Let people be healed as they witness your message come alive in front of their eyes. Let them be set free from whatever worries or fears or bondage may be here today. Let it be clear. In Jesus' name we pray. And as we transition into the baptism service, let a powerful anointing of your presence be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I went to Africa with Mother Teresa. How many have ever heard of Mother Teresa? I married that saint. <laughs> and she has driven up and down the road with me all over the world. And I, and I love my wife. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my wife. And so I didn't want to forget you. I love you. And I love my two kids, Josh and Charity. They have done homework in the back seat of a car like you for years to keep this ministry going. And why would we do all that? Why didn't we just stay in Jackson County? You know, God just put a, a burden for the lost in my heart right early on. Even as a youth pastor, I felt compelled to go out and do evangelism. And I never dreamed I'd be using a potter's wheel. When we went to Africa, we had a Billy Graham idea with a big tent. And we had big tents. And I, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story how this all got started. But you can see that we use art to bridge over into people's lives. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, how do you do that? See, the big tent, I realized real fast, mostly Christian-oriented people came to the tent. How do you actually get lost people to listen to you long enough to present the gospel to them? And when we left Africa into Europe, 
Well, the big tent never would have worked there. Through art, through a simple potter's wheel or a painting like this one, we were able to literally talk to hundreds and hundreds of people and share with them the gospel. And this is key in places like France, Portugal. I'm telling you, you have to get away into their culture long enough to, to listen. Amen? And this is what this is all about. This painting is called The Valley of Decision. And we all have to make decisions in life. We can't get away from them. And I'm going to be asking you to make a decision at the end of the service. It's the most important decision that you will ever make. Once you see the gospel, I think you will want to choose life and not death. I'm going to ask you to reconfirm a life of true blessing and not cursing. I'm going to ask you to put your trust in Jesus and not this world. The valley of decision is obviously an American genre. It's got the American cowboy. It talks about our love of liberty and independence, but it's also presenting to you a journey. He could get on his horse and go back, or he could go forward. He has to make a decision. And that's what that painting is all about. In the book of Joel, put my my glasses on. In the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible has a really interesting passage here. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Wow. There are so many people in this world that have never put their trust in Jesus Christ. And that's our task, to get to them to explain to them somehow that they will be able to make the ultimate decision. I know many of you are aware of what's happening in our culture. And there's a lot of pressure on the Christian community to preach the gospel as a life enhancement course. And it does enhance your life. But at the core of Jesus' claim on your soul is an ultimatum. Life or death. Blessing or cursing, choose me, Jesus, or the world. And I'm going to choose to use Jeremiah today to show you this very, very clear. See, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was one of the prophets of God. God spoke to Jeremiah and said, go down to the potter's house. Because there you're going to hear my word. And when he went down to the potter's house, he heard the word of God. He saw the word of God. One of the names of a prophet is a seer. He is able to see something happening. And today you're going to see what Jeremiah saw. Jeremiah saw that as the clay was in the hand of the potter, so too are people in the hand of God. Let me explain how spiritual this is and what's really going on here. Maybe you never wondered or asked yourself, why did Jesus make clay like this and put it inside a blind man's eye? You ever wonder why he did that? I'm going to tell you why. Because you and I are made out of clay. And Jesus knew what part was missing. So he just made some real quick and added what was missing. And that man could see. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This was all a big, wonderful idea surrounding his ultimate goal, which was to start a family. God wanted to start a family. So he created a big garden to put his family in. It's called earth. It's our world. God did a good job. We know his favorite colors. Blue, we see it in the sky. Green, he likes green. He put it everywhere and he splashed color. He loves color. He loves it. But he made all these animals, cool stuff, for one purpose. To give his family a place to hang out. And in the end, God goes into that garden he creates and he says, Man, this is going to be good. This is going to be the ultimate thing I'm going to create. I'm going to create people in my own image. So he stoops up a big ball of clay and he takes a deep breath. Take a deep breath. <gasps> Hold it. Let it out. 
Did you take a deep breath? I love these guys down here watching. But when God breathed into the clay, guess what happened? He created a human being in his own likeness. I mean, I don't know what God said, but it was something probably like this. He said, wow, you look great. I hope you like this world I've given you. And, and oh, oh, by the way, we're going to be partners down here. I want you to get in on the action. You start naming everything you see. I could have named it, but I want you to name it. So he's walking around, this man made out of clay, named Adam. It's in the Bible. He's naming everything. He says, this is wild. He's got to discover gold. And ooh, I mean, there was no sin, no darkness, no disease. Everything is beautiful. Wow. And he, God would come in and says, how's it going, man? And Adam would say, I, I, you know, this is wild what you've created for me. But I still feel like something's missing. And God probably said, I, was, I knew you were going to get to that. I wanted to start a family, and that's inside you. So take a nap. And even to this day, men get their best breakthroughs when they take a nap. <laughs> Somebody say amen or oh me. Adam takes a nap, and God did it again. He goes inside that man of clay and pulls a little bit out and says, mm hmm I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. You ain't going to believe this. And, you know, I don't know what the, the original language was in the garden. It could have been Hebrew. I don't know. But I think when, you know, I don't have much time here. But, but you know, I could, I, could, I could do other body parts, but this is a G-rated show. You know, it's just a joke. But anyway, can you imagine no sin, no wrinkles, no cellulite? Adam wakes up. Here she comes stepping through the fog and the steam of the garden. And he, oh, I can only imagine. He, he looks at that and he says, oh, I, I used orangutan last week. That won't work. I got to name this. I got to name this. She's walking toward him. He's going, wow, man. Wow, man, woman. Right? <laughs> Woman still means wildman. Every, and if you don't believe me, wait till you turn 16, 17. You'll know that this preacher was telling you the truth. It was God's idea, a man and a woman. And when a man and a woman do it God's way, that's still the best life that can ever be lived on planet Earth. The most fulfilling, the most satisfying. It's God's design. But how many know something went terribly wrong in our garden? Yeah. Yeah. All over the world, my job is to tell people what went wrong. I remember showing up in a village one time, and they, they said, do, you, do, do Americans actually teach in school that, that, that we, were, we were descended from monkeys? And I said, well, they teach it. They, they laugh like hyenas. They said, how could Americans be so smart and, and believe that they came from monkeys? Everybody knows we came from crocodiles. See, I, and I have to tell them. And then they ask me, they say, if your God's so good, why did she die of HIV AIDS? See, a lot of people are confused about that. People are always talking about an act of God when a tornado tears up a, a neighborhood. No, it's not an act of God. Something went wrong down here. God had created another being, a wonderful being. But he was so good at his job, he thought he could do God's job better than God. God had to fire him. Guess what his name is? Satan. Satan. Diablo. Hmm? I don't know if I got the eyes on this one right or not, but it doesn't matter. He's gonna, he's, I wanted to give you a clue. What, what, what happened down here? Two horns. I'm giving you the clue. The devil got fired. He's homeless. He can't pay his bills. So he says, I've got to find some way to get more time. I'm in trouble. God has condemned me. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I've got an idea. And he invents something called kidnapping. And he comes down to our world and he kidnaps us, God's family. He says, if I, as long as I've got a hold on them, I got leverage over God, and I'm going to buy myself all the time I want. How many know this broke God's heart? The day that our forefathers betrayed 
God the Father. Guess what started happening to the clay people? From that time, a new thing was introduced into planet Earth. It's called time. And from that day, the people made out of clay began to dry up. Satan came to steal, to kill, to destroy. God made us to be beautiful, useful, and valuable. But from that day, the clay people began to dry up. And guess what? As the clay is in the potter's hand, you're seeing what Jeremiah saw that day when he entered into the potter's house. It says, literally, as the clay is in God's hand, so are people in his hand. This clay is exposing its time limit. It's already past the time that it can respond to me as a potter. And this is what Satan wants to do to every lump of clay that I'm talking to right now. He wants to keep you so distracted that you never respond to God's touch. You're going to see this in a moment. This pot can be broken very easily. Satan really desires for each of you to become a crack pot and never become beautiful, useful, and valuable. This broke God's heart. God went to work to save his family. He sent preachers, prophets. He even, my God, he even backed up Moses with supernatural visitations. He split oceans to show his family that there's, there could be a way back. You don't have to dry up and be tossed away from me forever. Even with miracles, people couldn't follow God for very long. He said, I'm going to put my heart into one of these people made out of clay and maybe we can have a good kingdom and a bad kingdom or something. David shows up. King David. He's got the heart of God. But even that man in his brokenness commits adultery and then murder to cover up his mess. God said, There's no I knew it was going to come to this. There's only one way out. I'm going to have to pay the ransom for my kidnapped family. I've got to find a way to become clay. I've got to find a way to become like them so I can tell them what I'm going to do. And he finds one little girl that still really believed in him. What was her name? Mary. Mary. And he says, Mary, if you can just believe Mary... I'm going to borrow your clay and I'm going to find a legal way to enter into this world. He did it. Emmanuel, God with us. Mary believed and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. This baby looked like his mother but there was something in his blood came from his father. And even today, if you want to know who these guys belong to, test their blood. Their blood will match their father's blood. This blood was holy. And he starts walking around and he says, I'm showing you the way, the truth, and the lifestyle that you and I were supposed to have together. What did it look like? Cripples. He says, I, did, I never designed you to be broken. He would heal them. He showed up and says, Hey, you don't have to dry up. If you can believe, if you can believe that I am the resurrection and the life, if you can believe in me, you don't have to dry up and die. You can live forever. And he even raised the boy out of the casket and gave him back to his mother. God never believed in death. Wow. Say wow. Say it backwards. Gospel, you'll be speaking in tongues before you know it. That's just a joke. Just trying to lighten it up a little bit in here. Guys, Jesus demonstrated the way, the truth, and the lifestyle, and then he does something believable. I'm going to tell you about it. We were
house with Jeremiah if we could, but we're doing the next best thing. We're bringing it to you. I want you to see what Jeremiah saw. What am I adding to this clay? Can you see it? Look. What am I adding to it? I'm doing it again. What, are you watching? What am I adding? Water. Say water. water. Without the water, the clay will dry up. It will not respond to my hands without the water. You're seeing what Jeremiah saw. The first thing I did this morning is I picked this clay up and I put it on the rock, which is this wheel. And I think Jeremiah would have sat there as a prophet, as a seer, and he would have watched that potter pick the clay up and slam it down on that rock, and he would probably went, wow! Did you see that? That's what God's going to do. He's going to pick up his people and save them. He was hearing the Spirit talk to him. He said, oh, I'm going to watch what happens. And he would have seen that rock. This would have been a big kick wheel in those days. And we used one in Africa. I mean, I spun that big rock so many times. My leg got so big. I mean, it was terrible. I noticed that the kids didn't want to go swimming anymore with me. I think it was the skinny leg on this side and the big leg on this side. I looked like a freak. And the day that the baboons came in the backyard and I tried to run away and I just kept spinning in a circle. <laughs> We gave up the big kick wheel and got electricity in Africa. Praise God. But this would have been a big wheel. And I know Jeremiah would have, would have instantly recognized that the rock was Christ. Who is our rock? And this clay has no power to save itself. It doesn't even know if it's going to be a teacup or a vase or a bowl. And guess what? When people ask you what you're going to be when you grow up, we don't know what we're going to be. That's beyond the power of clay. Clay only has one power given to it by God, and that is the power to surrender. Say, I surrender everything to you, Jesus. Jeremiah would have seen that, that he couldn't save himself God was going to have to pick us up himself. The scriptures say in Jeremiah that the vessel that the potter was making was marred. The King James says marred. In other words, it had a mistake in it. So the potter made it again another vessel as it seemed good to him. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God can deal with our mistakes? So I have to add water. Say water. Maybe this is why Jesus showed up at that festival and he stood up on the last day and said, Hey! Is anybody thirsty? Because if you are, come to me. I'm going to give you living water that you don't have to be thirsty anymore. See, there's a thirst in this clay. And there's a thirst in your clay. And there's a bunch of us in this room, even today, that are trying to quench that thirst. Drugs. I don't know, overeating? You, don't, you, you would have to answer that question. Maybe you just spend so much time on the iPhone. I don't know. I don't know. But I know you're made out of clay. And each one of us has that thirst inside. And as time goes on, we get a little wrinkled and a little more brittle. Don't look at anybody right now. But some of us have even put clay on this morning to cover up the fact that the time is going. I didn't look at you. I don't get sensitive, see. People get sensitive when they realize what's really going on. Do you see it like Jeremiah is seeing it? What else am I adding to this clay? The, what? Pressure. Good for you. You can see good, and that's exactly right. Pressure. Now, this is, this is going to help pastor now, because a lot of you got mad at him you, you were listening to those great preachers he's got, and you're going, man, if I just give my life to Jesus, everything's going to be made brand new. Well, yeah, everything is being made brand new, but guess what? All the old things have got to pass away. And you don't get mad at your pastor, ever. He didn't lie to you. Pressure, 
comes to every real person that gives their life into God's hands. Things just don't become beautiful and wonderful overnight. God has to start applying a little pressure sometimes in our lives to get us to respond in the right direction. Somebody say amen or oh me. Yeah, there's more oh me's now than amen, see. Why? Because it's just the way life is. Let's check in with you, see how you're doing. Maybe you're getting a little nervous. I don't know. How are you doing? What did you say when they asked you that this morning? Somebody probably asked you, how are you doing? And what did you say? Yeah, you did, didn't you? I would have said the same thing. But that's probably more like where a lot of us are. Huh? We want people to think that we're centered in the hands of God and everything's okay. But if we were really honest with ourselves, we probably resemble this piece of clay more. This is you Monday with no coffee. See? Life for some of us in this room feels about like this. We don't feel centered in God's hands. We feel like life is out of control. We feel double-minded and we feel unstable in all our ways. And, and the master potter is trying to put our lives in order. Right? Oh boy. Let, I might as well go for it. Is it okay? Jeremiah would have said, where did you get that clay? He said, I dug it up. The potter's field. He said, I see that, that there's something wrong with that piece of clay. Yeah, it's got some mistakes in it, but I, I'm going to make it another vessel in a minute. And he said, what, 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 what was wrong with it? He said, well, sometimes when I dig up my clay, it's got sticks and stones in it. Oh, boy. Are you going there, pastor? Yeah. Got to. This is exaggerated. But folks, there's sticks and stones in our clay too. And God's got to do this process of centering and He's got to move His Holy Spirit through our life and find every little stone. Because if, if that stone is allowed to remain or that stick in our life, we will, we will surely end up... It will abort the process of what God's trying to do. Make no mistake. He says, I knew you before the foundations of the earth. I know the plans that I have for you, says God. A future and a hope. I know. It's good stuff I've got for you. But you've got to keep surrendering your life. See, can you imagine that woman at the well, Jesus with his x-ray vision looking right through her life. He says, how are you doing? Fine. No, you're not. You're so thirsty, woman. You've already tried five men to quench your thirst. And the one you're living with now, you didn't even take the time to get married to. You can't quench your thirst that way. You need me to give you living water. He can see every stick, every stone in our clay. It's true. We just must trust him and learn to let them go. Say, let it go. Look at your neighbor. I'm going to give you permission. Don't, don't feel nervous. But look at your friend right now next to you and say, if you forgive, you get to live. Yeah, it's a, it's a deep truth you're sharing with them right now. See, you're an evangelist too. See, forgive and live. Yeah, tell them. Smile when you do it. Say, you've got to learn to let it go. If you let it go, God will take it away. Folks, I'm going to give you a test right now. School's about to start. Young guys, I want to see if you know this. I believe the devil is international. I'm going to give you a little saying and see if you can finish it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. See, even in Mariana, Florida, the devil has told that lie. He's told it everywhere he can. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. Well, guess what? Words do hurt people. Words is how this world was created. God said, let there be, and there was, and you were created in his image. And every time you open your mouth, mama or daddy, to these little guys, guess what? You're shaping them because words form pictures. And we become what we behold inside. Uh-oh, see? Sticks and stones. Words go into our clay. We all pick them up walking through life, folks. 
rolling down the hill of life, you're going to pick up some sticks and stones. Have you ever been stabbed in the back? Betrayed? Let down? Gone through a divorce? I don't know what is in your clay, but God does. Amen? And we have to learn to let it go, don't we? It's called forgiveness. Say, forgive and live. Forgive. See, you know the name of it. I, sometimes the Lord opens my heart and I can hear what it is and I'll call it out. Just to, so you know, he knows. I remember being in a village one time and that happened. We couldn't get a breakthrough. So God was gracious and he began to tell me what was wrong with some of the people. And I just said, well, I'm in an African village. I'm going to go for it. Well, I didn't know that this pastor was there listening, and he, and he was amazed by that. He said, you've got to come to my church, Brother King. You must come to my church. And so I said, I'd love to come. He had a church of, of all women, essentially. There were all women there. They worked in the city. When we got there, this is how he introduced me. He says, Pastor King is coming to preach the gospel, but you will not tell him what is wrong with you. God will tell him what is wrong with you. And he will tell you. Oh, that's a terrible introduction, folks. <laughs> I was so nervous. I got so Pentecostal. I was pushing people over. I, I was desperate. Nothing was happening. It was terrible. And then finally God said, she's got HIV. Tell her she's been deceiving everybody. And I didn't want to do it, but I did. And God knew the stick that was in her clay. That lady so dramatically gave her life to Christ. That whole community was transformed. They built a church over the miracle that took place in that woman's life. Only God can do that. But God knows. God knows. And we have to trust Him. Say, let it go. Now, you can see my clay here. I don't know if you can see the scars left in this clay by these sticks that were put in it. How many of you have ever said this or you heard someone say this? I can forgive him, but I can never forget. I can forgive her, but I can never forget what she did to me. How many? Do you know what we're talking about here is so powerful? Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12 says, I will be so merciful to you, God speaking. I will not be able to remember your sins anymore. How much more shall the blood of Christ, Hebrews 9, 14, <laughs> even purge our conscience so we can serve the living God? The blood of Jesus is so powerful, it not only removes your sin, it even has the power to purge your memory about the event. God can't remember it anymore, and you will... The sting of it will leave your life too. This is the power of the gospel. Amen? I pray you never forget what I'm about to show you. Some of you have scars in this room today. But the good news is the blood of Jesus has the power to remove them. I don't know if you can see what's happening here. But see, when Jesus came, he just didn't demonstrate the way, the truth, and the life. He allowed himself to be executed in our place. I want you to understand what that really means. At that moment, I think Jeremiah's vision, prophetic vision, opened up so dramatically. He understood that as Moses lifted up that serpent on the pole in the wilderness. And the Israelites looked at that cross with a snake on it. He, at that moment, I think the dots were connecting and he was understanding Jesus was coming. And as he hung on that cross and was executed in our place and that powerful, precious blood began to flow, Jesus was becoming not only the snake, sin itself, he was becoming you personally. Now this is a bigger miracle than I can explain. Jesus became your heart attack. 
Jesus became your divorce. Jesus had to become the, the tears of us all. Jesus had to become Hitler. Jesus had to become the Jews that died in the gas chamber. Jesus had to become your filth. You have to understand that to get this. His love was so intense. He says, I willingly go down and I allow myself to become every molested child. It was so filthy and so vile that the father couldn't even look at his own son. But that blood had to be spilt. And Jesus gives his life for us on that cross. My God, when I think of that, he, His Spirit leaves the cross. And the Apostles' Creed tells us, and the Bible, Scriptures tell us, He descends into hell. Why did He have to go to hell? Because that was where each of us were going because we were separated from God. I've often asked him, I said, Lord, why did you take three days? You know, if I was God, I'd say, okay, I'm here, done, I'm going back. Boom! You know, but no, Jesus hangs out in hell for three whole days. Why? And he looks right at you as if you were the only one in the world. And he said, I would not leave hell until I found the keys to your jail cell. I loved you too much to leave you here. I wouldn't leave until I took my blood and washed away all the accusations and charges against you. Oh, you have to accept it. Christ died in your place. Do you see what has happened to my, my man of clay? Where are the scars? Where They're gone. You can't find them. And this is what his powerful blood did. It washed us clean. Not just from the sticks and stones, but whatever was left in us. Somebody, you should shout. Well, maybe do a backflip even. I mean, it's profound stuff. Remember the scripture? Be still and know that I'm God. Once the clay becomes still and all the sticks and stones are gone, then and only then can the potter execute his master plan. Do you see how still this is getting? I hope you can. This is not my best work, but we're going to do the best we can. I want you to see what's going to happen now. This is what Jeremiah saw. He would have seen that potter's hand no longer working on the outside, but going to a new place in the relationship with the clay. Say inside. inside. And what, I'm, what he saw and what you're seeing now is so profound, no other religion in the world can talk about what I'm showing you. Say inside. And I know, I've had the great privilege of going to Hindu temples. I've gone to the mosque. I've gone where they train the witch doctors. I've gone there. I physically have gone there. And I tell you, in all my travels, not one Muslim in the world would ever talk about Allah or Muhammad living inside them. Say inside. See, what you're seeing is the secret to Christianity. Behold, I stand at the door and of your heart and I knock. If you will let me come inside, say inside. Then 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, I will be your God and you will be my person. God walks and talks in the real Christian. And if God comes to live inside you, then you must be pure. 
You must be holy because God could not live in an unclean vessel. Oh boy. Shout hallelujah or something. <laughs> you are pure. You are holy because of Christ's blood. God is saying to you, you are not guilty anymore. My love's that big. I know you blew it. I know you made a mistake. And I knew where you were headed. But I love you so much, baby. You're going to be beautiful and useful and valuable anyway. If you can let me just come to live inside you. Are you with me? I know they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. At the beginning of the year, I, went, I took a trip over to Israel. And they told me, they said, they said Brother King, we have the Ark. We know where it is. And we're rebuilding the temple. And I, and I just smiled. This is, this is beautiful. I smiled at him. I, I love him. I love him. He's a Jew. I love him. I love him. But even if you telling me the truth, and you got the Ark of the Covenant, and that big golden box, you didn't get it. God was doing an illustrated sermon like I'm showing you. He, he doesn't want to live in a big golden box. No, he was trying to get the truth to you. The idea, I'm coming, I'm going to demonstrate, but then I'm going to prepare the way. You are going to be the golden box I'm going to live in now. Wow. He said, we're going to rebuild the temple. And I just smiled again, you know. Hey, even if they do rebuild the temple, God doesn't want to live in a big building. Whatever sacrifice is made there will be an abomination. God doesn't want to live in a temple made by hands. God wants to live inside you. You, me. Wow, isn't that wonderful? I'll never forget that night we were pastoring a homeless shelter and that guy followed us out that night and I thought, oh my Lord, he's going to murder us in the parking lot. And that, that strange voice was in him. He's like, you sure are a wonderful preacher. And I knew I wasn't dealing with humans anymore. You know, there was something living in him. And, I, and, I, and then all of a sudden something was moving in me. I said, oh no. It wasn't tacos either. <laughs> it was Jesus. And I told him, so you're going to come out of him tonight in Jesus' name. He's like, no. And I said, oh, yeah. I was, I, it was wonderful. The two hairs I still have on top of my head were like antennas, you know. I, I was like, wow, you know, what did I just say? And I said, you're going to come out of him. I said, look me in my eyes. And I tell you, he's a master evangelist and deliverance worker. He was giving me the words. I didn't have time to meditate on what to do. It was coming up. I said, look me in the eyes and tell me what you see. Then the big one went down and the little one came up and he said, no, you know, we see Jesus. And I thought, yeah, amen. That's right. That's right. You see Jesus. And I, I don't have, I, I'm not qualified to do what I'm about to do, but guess what? The one that lives in me is. Come on out. And they did. And I've never seen this before like that. They had to name themselves as they came out. Every one of them by name. Blasphemy, pride, every addiction. They named themselves. They lined up, named themselves, and then they moved out. Well, guess what? I never forgot that. He comes to live inside the real Christian. And you can't make anything from the outside you got to make it from the inside. Teacher, could you help me? I want to I wanna get one. I, wanna, I want an assistant to help me finish, and I'm going to be done here real soon. So I'm going to pick the one with the biggest smile. You smiling? Who's got the biggest smile? Does anybody want to help me finish? Oh, wow. Are you smiling? Let me see your dentures. <laughs> I'm not going to discriminate on age. You see what's happening? I'm expanding the heart of this vessel. I want it to contain a lot of fruit. And that's what Jesus does with us. He wants to expand your heart so you can bring some fruit. See, there's a table in heaven, and you're going to come one day with all your fruit. I don't know what kind of vessel you are, but he wants you to be an honorable one. 
How about eeny, meeny, meeny, okay, come, you, come, you had your hand up. Can you help him? Is he safe? All right. I want you to help me decorate. Will you? See that? Grab that one. This one? Yep, that one. We're going to finish it up. So what, can you see what I'm doing? Touch the clay like that and then just move it up and you give it the design you want right out of your heart. Like yep, like that, but come right on up. See, back row Baptists just don't get, don't get all the good stuff. See, you got to be up like this to see. Oh, well, maybe you got the camera. Can you see what they're doing? Cool. Awesome. Tell me your name. Leland. Hmm? Leland. Leland. Can I show him Leland? Let me show him what you did. Awesome. Now y'all give him a big round of applause. Because I'm going to show you what Leland did. Can you see? I don't know if you can see it. But he put a trail in this clay. It's his own design. There's only one of these in the world. Leland, you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, Leland. You did great. God always works like this with originals. There's only one bowl like this in the whole world, and there's only one of you. If I lose this, I can't get Leland back up here to do it just like that. It'll be different every time. And you're different. And you're supposed to be different. You're unique. And one day, when the master potter takes you in his hands, you're supposed to bring all the fruit that your life was supposed to have gathered. But guess what? This looks like a bowl, but it isn't finished. Can I show you what's wrong with it? Can you see that? If I put a lot of fruit in this one right now, what will happen? It will collapse, guaranteed. And I can only imagine Jeremiah watching that man, Potter, lift that thing off that rock. And he says, where are you going? He said, oh, come with me. I'm going to show you. And then he would have, I think his, his spiritual antenna would have flashed forward. And he would have seen Peter standing there with Jesus. And, and Jesus is about to go to the cross. And Peter's saying, oh, master, you can't go. They're going to they're gonna do terrible things. I, I, I don't, and, 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 and he's... Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter is talking for Satan. Going back to the words thing, did you know that you're probably never going to see the guy with two horns and a weird tail? But you may see him speaking through one of your best friends. And that day, Peter receives a prophecy, and he says, he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, you're going to collapse. The pressure is going to come on you, Peter, and you're going to collapse. You're going to forsake me. You're going to fall down. And Peter said, it'll never happen. But it did. Jesus was executed on that cross, and he was so concerned with his own well-being. When they challenged him, they said, are you a follower of this guy? He said, no. And he fell down. He collapsed under the pressure. Now, Jeremiah, I think, is seeing this by the Spirit. And he sees Jesus looking at Peter with love. And he says, Peter, don't worry about it when you do. Because there's a day coming, Peter, that I'm going to transform you like you will never believe. Peter, there's a day coming. Oh, you're going to understand everything that I've been telling you. And you, Peter, are going to be a... I don't know if you can hear that. Maybe I'll do it on this one. He looks at this guy after telling him he's going to be forsake, for, do the forsaking part, and then he, he says, don't worry, Peter. You're going to be a rock, baby. A real rock. And I'm going to build my church through you. What a strange thing to say. Jeremiah's following that guy out back. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to take the vessel and I'm going to baptize it in fire. The kiln's going to burn this thing for about three days and it's going to be baptized in fire. But when it comes out, it's going to be hard as a rock. <laughs> Fact, just go with me there to the day of Pentecost and you see what Jeremiah is seeing that day. Those people of clay are so broken, so wounded, but then all of a sudden they're hanging on in prayer and a mighty wind comes in and tongues of fire come down on those people of clay and you shall receive power.
power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Then you're going to go out to the whole world and be my witnesses. It's Peter, the same dude filled with the Holy Ghost, stands up and says, Hey guys, this is what the prophet Jeremiah was trying to tell us. Wow. <laughs> As the clay is in the hand of the potter, so too are people in the hand of God. Amen. 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 Guys, we have only two choices. Every boy, girl, man, woman on this planet has to make a decision. You and I and multitudes around us are in the valley of decision. You can dry up, be a crackpot, or you can give your life into the potter's hands. If you can surrender your life, he will pick you up and he will plant you on the rock that is himself. He will remove the sticks and the stones. And if you will let him come inside, he will shape your life into something beautiful, useful, and valuable. I don't care if we stuff this clay with $100 bills and fly it on Air Force One where everybody says, wow, he's rich and powerful. At the end of the day, clay only has two places to go, back into the ground from where it came from, or at the table with the master. This is the number one job of each one of us is to get people to understand that. How much he loves us. Oh, how much he loves us. Wow. I want you to make a good decision. Because you make decisions in this life, and then those decisions make you. Amen? Maybe if the, if the worship leader is here, and Pastor Tyler will tell us about the baptisms, maybe you can be baptized today. I talked to him, and he said, yeah, they want to do it. We're ready. Maybe today you want to reconnect your life. To him. I don't know where you are in the process. Maybe you're about to come off the wheel. <laughs> if life keeps spinning days, days into weeks, maybe you're that piece of clay today. Maybe there is a stick or stone there, and today you'd like to know that it's gone. Please. Today I'm going to give you that choice. I want maybe just all of us stand to our feet as we get ready to make this choice. Some of you know you're in his hands. But I believe many of you today are going to come forward and, and put your, your life in His hands. Maybe for the first time, or maybe you just want to, to honor what He's already done. Maybe you know, but I know, I know this. There's not a bar in Jackson County that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to people in. How much more He's speaking to you today. It's usually a still, small voice. You say, how do I know he's calling me? <laughs> you know. And every person Jesus called, he's called them publicly. There's no closet Christians. So I want you to do what the tax collector did, the fishermen did. They dropped their nets and they started following him. Today, you're just gonna follow right up front. But if you can't take six steps or seven steps, you won't last long. I want you to choose life, not death. I want you to choose blessing, not cursing. I guarantee you there's only two outcomes in this life. Dried up, cracked pot, or beautiful, useful, and valuable. And I know which one God wants you to be. He knows the plans that He has for you. Beautiful, valuable, useful. As they begin to worship the Lord again, I want every boy, 
every girl, every man, every woman, that the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart to come as quick as you can and stand here with Pastor Ford. So even now, start coming. I'm going to pray and I'm going to bind the devil. And what I do, I'm going to use the precious name of Jesus. And even if a, a heroin handcuff has a hold of you, when I, when I use the name of Jesus, it will, it will loosen. Whatever's got a hold on you. Maybe you, you in, in, in internet porn have gone a few steps too far. I'm going to use the name of Jesus. Maybe it's a big reason you want to come. Maybe it's a little reason. Maybe it's just love. But when I use the name of Jesus, it's going to go loose. And you can pull out. You can pull out. And you can be free. But you got to go and follow him. Are you ready? Let him come to live inside. Satan, we bind you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Loose that man, loose that woman, loose that boy, loose that girl. In the name of Jesus, they're following Jesus. Come, come, hurry, hurry, hurry. You know if he's calling you, you know. Hurry, hurry.